Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel. This is Lounge Academy, my name's Howard, and I'll be your jazz improvisation instructor today. I'm gonna explain, this is, this is my, I consider this my first stab at instructing on, on YouTube on improvisation. And I've been thinking about it a long time. I taught myself how to do it. And it took literally a whole bunch of decades, a lot of decades. And I figured out a system that worked well for me. And after learning the other systems and failing at them, I mean really failing at them, um, My system, I'd like to talk to you, but this, this is stuff that your, your instructors and most of you will probably disagree with or think it's, you know, just n not be able to relate to it at all. And probably 80% will be uh, my fault for uh, poorly uh, explaining it because I haven't really figured out a way to explain this with any kind of uh, predictability yet. But um, some of you might get it, or it'll just make me better at explaining it. It'll force me to think it through. No math, okay? It's good to, good to have a background in theory. I highly recommend that, that uh, basic rules of harmony, circle of fifths, um, you know, it helps to be able to read music, all that stuff. You know, a lot of, I think a lot of people that are interested in improvising, I think the majority of people want to get away from the sheet music. And I know that's how I was. You know, I learned to read from, as a kid. And um, it always amazed me that people could even play a single note away from the sheet. Like, how would you know that no to work, you know? So that's what, that's what kind of got me on this path a long time ago. And it was a big mystery. And I went to, so I went to college and just to, actually I went back to college um, to take music. I thought I was gonna take a course and I wound up sticking around for two years and got an associate's degree in performance because I liked it so much. I liked, uh, I liked the theory so much because it was like the answer to this mystery of how, how music is built, you know. So, so it's, good, it's good to do that. And I also think, I, I recommend that um, you, you do some of the Mohegan jazz theory. He's got four books. He, he was an instructor at Juilliard. These books were written in the, I don't know, in the 50s or 60s. And there's, I think they're still in print. If you, if you ask me, I'll put links up, you know. If one person asks me in the comments, I'll put a link to where you can buy these. But there's, and, and they're very interesting, but you know, their approach is not what worked for me. But there is one series of chapters in one of the four books by Mahegan that I think is very helpful. And it's a 60 chord, um, it's a 60 chord voicing system that he devised where you, you kind of, you train yourself. It, it takes a few monotonous months to, 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 you know, to make it useful. And it's really worth throwing away a few months of your life to do this because You'll have it as an underpinning for everything you do that I'm going to talk about next, where you get away from the theory and the math, because that's not the creative part of my mind. So, and it didn't work for me doing it that way. I was, you know, I'm like an engineer. Um, I can, I like to figure things out and all this stuff, you know what, but it didn't work for me. I was, I was able to play charts and write my own and, and go out and play a gig 
even doing that, um, put, making my own arrangement around a lot of standards from the fake book, so I'd have a, 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 you know, a few sets to get through an evening of cocktail piano. And, but it was, it was stiff, and I never considered myself really playing. And people would say, what do you mean you, what do you, mean you can't play the piano? You're playing it. You're, you just played, uh, you, know, re, you know, teach me tonight. Or uh, you just played, isn't it a pity? But I, I wasn't. I was being a, a flea, a trained flea, right? Isn't that how you feel, a lot of you out there, when you're kind of... Even though you, you take it to the next level, like first, all you can do is read sheet music and you're, you train your fingers through muscle memory to memorize it so you don't need the music anymore. But you don't know what the, you don't, you don't understand it in terms of chords or anything. So then you go to the level like I did in college and, and you, know, you, don't you don't need college to do that. You could just study the circle of fists and the, how, how, scales are spelled and formed and how chords are and and then the extended chord the chords we're interested in jazz where you you, you know you they got to be at least enough this is the stuff that that mohegan does that i do recommend you do if you're curious about it ask me i'll put the link up buy the book read those chapters and study them for like the rest of the year if you have to that's just my recommendation um, you, you could probably do this without doing that, but it's a, it's a great way to give you an underpinning of basic voicing. So no matter how lousy you are at the time, in, with, in, within your you know, timeline of becoming and being a musician, uh, you'll always sound like you're playing... sound like like triads like you're playing rock right you don't want to sound like this when you're playing jazz you don't want to play um, a triad you don't even want to play a seventh unless you're doing it intentionally because it has a certain thing you need right there and then but everything's got to be like a, a, at least a ninth or it's, it's just not going to sound like uh, that, that, that modality, you know, that uh, I'm not talking about scale modes. I mean just that the, the world of the standards where the sensibilities were during the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s when this stuff was, was just considered pop music, you know? It's just, it's just a... So you do need that. And... So you start learning that stuff, and then you basically, when I was at that point after college, I still, I still didn't feel like I was improvising because I wasn't. And I even frustrated my teacher who was, you know, great, you know, and uh, old timer, played classical, played jazz, played with some big bands, was very successful at teaching people to play jazz piano. And I had no trouble um, understanding the concepts, learning, you know, you know what score, what chord do you, do you play with what scale, and vice versa, and altered chords, and you know, the dif different rhythmic things, you know, that basic rhythmic thirds and triplets and things, you know, that th those feels, try to get a basic swing sound. You know, I'm, I'm mechanically inclined, so I mean, I could figure out all that stuff. I knew it cold. I could have taught it. I could have taught that just like how I learned it. But I couldn't, I couldn't get airborne. You know what I mean? When you hear music, there's uh, a magic quality to it where it's unexplainable why it sounds like a record. You ever notice that? Like you, you notice some people, some musicians, you, you might say, gee, they're so good. They, they could play two notes and it sounds like music for some reason. And um, 
or one, which is try to try to solve that with physics, right? How can one, a person play one note and it sounds fantastic? It sounds like it has time and elements and you know, like it's alive. It's not explainable. Well, that that's the part um, that my system that I created and taught myself, that, that's what it uh, takes on, is the unexplainable, okay? So that's why I can talk and, I can talk and play. Because I'm not doing math or, I don't even know what chord I'm gonna go to next. I could carry on all kinds of conversations doing this. It's a great gimmick, too. That's the takeaway people have when they come see me play. You know, I'll shake their hand, I'll talk, and I won't stop playing. They don't care about anything else. That's the thing they go home and tell their friends about. But the ability to do that, that trick, be able to talk and play and stuff. It has at its root what I'm talking about teaching you, or teaching you how to teach yourself. Okay, now, you know, I don't think I'm great or anything. I my most of my musician friends blow me away. You know, they're way better, but I'm improving pretty quickly still. And because um, it finally, I finally got traction with all of this. So the point is, I'm not saying like, like you may not necessarily want to play what I just played or, or that it's, you know, very valid on any level other than if I did that back when I was struggling with how to turn how to how to turn theory and you know expertise in theory and harmony and charts and how to compose really, like when when I used to do these these charts I would do and go out and play a, a a gig. I didn't do too many, but I did some, and they came. They came off okay, but I was, you know, I I was, I wasn't satisfied with it because I didn't feel like I was really doing it. I, I felt like I was being being just being a robot. Like I programmed myself. I wrote my own charts, so it's like, well, I guess that's like improvising, but it really wasn't. It's more like composing. You know, when you go through and you take a standard, and this is the way the teachers all teach you to do it because. And I could understand why. First of all, it's the way they learned. And secondly, at the end of like a, students aren't the only ones being tested when there is a teacher-student relationship, right? Students being tested, so is the teacher. The teacher is being tested by the results the student has. So at the end of their semester or, or whatever, uh, increment you happen to be working with, whether it's a formal situation or, or just private lessons, at some point, progress has to be measured, if nothing else, but for a marketing tool. You know, is the product or service you're paying for um, a good value? You know, well, if you're taking piano lessons or jazz lessons, have you, have you progressed from point A to point B on your timeline, you know, have, have, uh, have you become more of a musician, a more fluent improviser? Well, that puts a lot of pressure on a teacher because the understanding that I've acquired through my own, you know, just kind of going in my own direction with this is that um, you can't get there, you can't get there from here. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't. You can't teach your way there. The stuff you learn is all good. And, and you, could, you could bring that in. And the more you know, the better. But it's really the busy work you do while you're waiting for the magic to
to happen. And I say, use that term magic as a, as a scientific term because to me that term means anything that can't be explained um, by you, by the observer. You know, like if a magician does a trick and makes, a, you know, a chicken fall out of his wallet or something, if you don't know how to do that, then my, that's my definition of magic, even though everyone else in the room might know it, or certainly he knows how to do it, and it's a trick, right? So it's really not magic, but I'm, that's the way I'm using magic, because you want music to be magical, especially if you're the one playing it. You want to not know where it's coming from. So when I play, I'm not thinking. Sometimes I think, I'm just letting it happen. But that didn't just happen, okay? I've got a... The idea is to make I know I'm going all over the place with this, so I admire you a lot if you could stick with me with this. You know, it might mean you're as whacked out as I seem to be, and maybe that's the way you got to be with this. You got to break, you know, break the mold of teaching. You know, the, the, you don't want to just be on this little conveyor belt with everybody else who winds up ultimately, for the most part, frustrated as I did. Um, so, kind of in a nutshell, here's another way to look at where I'm going with this. The arrangements, the music, the style, the musicality of it, the magic of it, which I think the, ma the magic of music, I think a lot of it is, is the time. I think the time element is the whole thing. And it takes a long time for a person, for me, and I know because I try to explain it to people that are close to me, that are seriously into music, and they don't necessarily get it. But I know a lot of musicians that, that do, for sure. And they probably have a much more deeper understanding than I do, but at least I understand that time, this thing of time, I'm, you know, it's beyond meter and having a metronomic uh, study, you know, calculated meter, which you have to do, you know, count those quarter notes. You don't want to speed up, slow down, work out with the metronome. Very important because you can't get time without that. But that's, that's kind of a, a mechanical thing you have to do before the, the magic time can happen. And the magic time is, is your own. It's when, you, when, when your own, we all have time. We all have a rhythm. In fact, the, the Chinese just developed a system that they're using on their public where they use it like facial recognition cams. Like we have here people like going into a stadium the government can like check out all our faces, like it's just as if they're reading a license plate. Goes into a database, checks it out, sees if you're wanted or if you're you know somebody they should be interested in. Um, it's almost like fingerprinting. It's real time. They could see your face. They could do this. In China, they've taken it a step further. I saw recently, where um, they're really into tech, and they can now read a person's. Um, body English, <laughs> maybe that's ironic to use that term, but their, their walking patterns, like they show a busy intersection over there, which most of them are, it's China. And it's as if like you could recognize your best buddy two blocks away if you see him coming. You can't see his face, you might not recognize the jacket he's wearing, maybe you've never seen it before, it's new. But the way they walk, their gait, um, something, you know, there's a, there's a certain rhythm we have. Um, 
that's, that's unique. And, and that's how that technology works, where they could, that's partially how it works. Um, pro probably measures different things, you know, how long your shoulders compared to your knees, the relationships of things. Uh, but it, I'm sure it also takes into account our time. When we talk, we have a time, right? We have a certain rhythm patterns and thing. When, when you're just moving, when you see somebody you know, you're familiar with them, you, you're just watching them do ordinary things with their, they're not being self-conscious. They have a time and that time has to be in your music for it to sound like magic, like magic because why does it sound like, like it should be on a record? You know, like you listen to a, it's the only thing I could way to explain it to somebody that, that hasn't um, gotten this, you know, understanding yet. Because, um, you know, I didn't get into well into my adulthood. So it's easy for me to, to maybe uh, talk about things that uh, people that developed musically very early um, as, as small, you know, that the more talented you are, the less you understand this. If you're from musical from birth, you probably don't think of anything. You just, you, you got all kinds of this, these abilities and talents that just make, make the music happen for you. And then you apply yourself on top of that and you study and apply that on top of everything else and you just keep going. Um, you know, for the rest of us, um, we, we have to find some kind of approach that can work for us to at least get us in the game. As I have done, and I feel successful at it, even though I got a long way to go, but I, I'm at least functional and I actually use it now um, to accomplish things. So where, I was, where I'm going with that is good for you if you can stick with me on this and I'm going all over the place, but it's, it's such a, I'm trying to touch on a lot of different things and eventually they, they, they become recognizable as really part of one big thing. What I, the way I see this is musicians develop their thing, their, their, their voice, their whatever it is they got, independent of a song they're playing, okay? So, like, I like to play every day and, and do what I was doing when I was showing you I can talk and play. I do kind of a free-form thing. It's not completely free-form. It's all based on things I've done at some point in the past that I've allowed to snowball into a big ball of things I do. You know, do different different stylistic things. Now this started out for me over, I, I know when exactly when I started this, it was in 1996 and now it's 2019. So every day I've been building this up for 23 years, okay? I've been building up the, the musical essence of me that has, that gets then poured into a mold each time a song is performed, right? Each time a standard is performed, like Teach Me Tonight, which happens to be in front of me because somebody requested it on Friday night. It's not really one of my songs. That's why the music's in front of me. And um, I don't arrange, I try not to arrange even songs I learn Although you can't help it, you fall into habits. You don't, you don't want to get locked into an arrangement, especially when you're improving and, and expanding yourself continually over the months and years. You want to be stuck with some arrangement you had when you, when you weren't that good. Or, you, you know, you've, and then you got to sit down and rethink it actively. Well, it's, it's nice if you can keep it flexible enough to where as you grow, that song that's in your repertoire grows along with you. So you don't, you're not just, again, playing by the sheet, that, even though you wrote the sheet, okay? So 
you make yourself musical and you give yourself a bigger and bigger vocabulary with, with every day you go forward, your horizons expand in a lot of different ways. And then you take those things and pour them into each song. So the, the song is like, is like a mold, okay? Picture it like you wanna make, uh, you know, a plastic uh, vase, right? You wanna make a plastic tip jar. So you got this plaster mold that's shaped the opposite of a tip jar that you're gonna, you know, like a plaster Paris mold, right? They used when you were at camp when you were a kid. I think, kid, do kids still do that? I doubt it. But um, the plaster is you, right? The song's only going to be as good as you, as you are at that moment. So, I mean, how many of us got all excited? How many times have you done this? You discover some song, a standard, you hear somebody do it. Maybe you never heard it before. Maybe you did, but you heard somebody do it in a way where you got excited about, you know, being able to interpret that song, how great it is. And you think, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reverse engineer what this guy's doing, and I'm going to do that song, and it's going to elevate me to that next level, or maybe, to, maybe it'll skip 10 levels. And I'm going to sound like pretty much like that guy doing it, because I know enough about theory to figure it all out. And you work and work and work at it, and you learn it, but you're disappointed in a sense. It's always worth adding a piece to your repertoire, but, and, and you learn by doing it, but you don't really get what you were after. You, you don't get the prize at the end because it's like, why doesn't it sound you know, like, that, like this guy? And, well, they're doing something rhythmically, you know? Maybe they're doing some kind of vamp or something. I know I'm pretty lame too, but at least I'm, I'm there now, you know, and improving um, from within. I entered the building now you know, the last few years. So, um, I'm in the room with the, with the better players, you know. I'm the worst one in the room, but I'm in the room. Now, it never sounds like you want. First of all, the guy you're copying is probably, very, is probably great. And he's probably being himself. He's not copying somebody. In some regard, he is, but he's, like, he's, he's got his thing, you know, that he can pour into that song. The song takes the shape of the mold, right? The plaster Paris mold. And when you're done, you got, here's a, here's a teach me tonight. I just, and you can make a hundred of them. Here's a mold of teach me tonight. And you get a hundred different musicians to, take that chart and do it and you're going to get it's going to sound different right and you want it to sound like you every you know I, I guess that you know this the approach that I, I learned and, and taught myself gets you to that place that sounds um, kind of a, a kind of tricky, which is, you know, the answer to when everybody tells you, you have to sound like yourself. How the hell do you know what you sound like if you've never sounded like anything before, right? How, you, it, how do you, you know, it, that doesn't make, it's not really helpful when teachers tell you that, even though they're telling you the right thing. And I would tell you that same thing too. You got to sound like yourself. Well, great. Tell me what I sound like 
so I can copy me and sound like me, right? <laughs> so my approach allows you to find your voice, whatever it is. For better or worse, you're going to be stuck with your voice. But you know what? Another theory of mine about the magic of music is if you can sound like you, if you could be authentic and sound and, and be yourself, get to that point where you, you, you know your voice and you can express it. Just like somebody who starts getting confident with getting up and giving a talk. Because they, they know their voice. They, they kind of know who they're going to be when they go up there. And they, they kind of know how the audience is going to react because they've seen it happen every time they've, you know, interacted with another human being. And they know it's going to be the same in front of that crowd. Um, or when a writer writes something, you know, um, I'm married to a writer, and I, I, years ago, this was, this was a big part of this. Um, one of the little pieces that be, really was important to my forming my philosophy on this. Um, I, I start when blogging became popular. I wanted to um, do some blogging, and I'm, I'm sitting there kind of struggling, you know, with and I'm writing, and you know how people write when they're not writers? And it doesn't sound like very conversational, it doesn't sound relaxed like the way I'm talking right now, for better or worse. I'm just talking the way I talk. And then all of a sudden you go to write and you're being very, you're really overthinking everything and you're writing very stiff and you're, you know, it sounds like Sounds like somebody writing instead of somebody communicating. And I'm, my, wife, my wife gave me some tips. She said, um, and this sounds obvious, you know, but it, good things do once they make sense. She said, just think when you write a sentence, I'm kind of paraphrasing how she told me, but said, uh, when you're writing, think just first Say it in your mind the way you would just say it to somebody. And then basically write that. You know, and then obviously you're going to want to clean up you know, grammar errors and things because you don't want people to think you're illiterate. But that, um, that tip is really a big deal. And I started doing that, and it slowly helped. And you know, I got to be pretty confident with my writing when I used to do a lot of blogging. And uh, that's what I do. And, and I started singing a few years ago. I, I train every day for singing, which I never thought I'd have the courage or requirements or even any reason to do that because I wasn't, I didn't think, you know, like it would, I was so bad at it, you know, that um, I didn't think it would really lead to anything worthwhile, but it has. It has, and I keep, I'm improving with that. It, it's, it's always fun to do things you're improving at, you know. So it helps me with my phrasing, you know. Think about how stiff people are, and this is all related. I know I'm going all over the place, but playing is the same as singing. If you play what you're thinking as if you're gonna, you know, just before it comes out, that split tiny fraction of a moment beforehand, just like when you're talking, you, you, you hear what you're gonna say, you know, just before. If you hear what you're going to say too much in advance, right? Like if you're looking around the next corner, like you're think as you're talking, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to make this point and that. It doesn't come out very well. You know, you just start tripping and falling. You sound stiff. Um, it's got to be uh, the way improvisation on the piano should be. 
you know, where it doesn't sound rehearsed because it's prepared, but it's not rehearsed, is, is the way I like, I think it should be. So, that's how you find your voice. The second part of that, when my wife told me, you know, think about it as you're speaking it. So you start, you're actually routing it through, you find yourself routing it through a different kind of channel, different brain canals when you're going to vocalize something. Or if you're thinking, how, how would I just say this if my buddy was sitting here and I was explaining it, or I'm explaining it to you. You want to do that musically, okay? And one of her, my uh, wife's friends, who's also a writer at the paper, we were walking around the park one day. She was complimenting me, this was a little, little while after, on my blogging, and I think on my Facebooking too by then. And she said, you know, you're really effective. And she's an editor, you know. And she said, you're really effective with your writing. Um, you found your voice, you know, and you're funny and this and that. And I said, found my voice, what does that mean, you know? Must mean something if a professional writer and editor told me that and I was thinking about it. Now I understand completely what it means. It means what your teacher's telling you all the time when they say, don't sound like somebody else, sound like you. Well, in order to do that, you have to find your voice. Not an easy thing to do. Uh, there's, it, you, you discover it as you practice every day, but you gotta be practicing kind of a free form so it could come out. And that's, that's what I'm gonna get into um, with, with this. If anybody wants me to do another lesson, I'm gonna get actually into what you're probably saying, get, get into that already. But there's no point to, because if I showed you, you can't find it that easily. It won't be meaningful and it won't accomplish anything. Like I said, I'm 23 years into doing this myself. Now, if somebody had taught this to me that I had faith in so I'd actually do it, rather than me developing it myself, would I have progressed faster? Maybe, right? Because I wouldn't have to be spending the time finding the path, I could have just followed it. But then on the other hand, when you make your own way and you own it, um, just wondering if this guy was gonna park his huge trailer, big car trailer pulled up out front because a whole bunch of them. There's a big cool car show at the convention center next door. Hot rods. I should have gone. Doesn't always work. <laughs> this is how I practice. It's, and I'll get into this stuff when I get into the actual lessons if you guys want me to. I don't think you will. I think you're going to think this was an hour out of your, I could see the comments. This was an hour out of my life I'll never get back. What does this have to do with improvising? It's the introduction. It's the welcome to my improvising class. It's how we do things at Lounge Academy. We learn to help you find your voice. So you can play whatever the hell you want to. and tell me you want me to actually do this or I won't bother and you'll always wonder about it if there was anything to it see I was just playing nothing you got to be able to play nothing. 
And you play nothing all different ways, as many ways as you can. And you start out, I'll show you how to start. I remember the first day I had this idea. I even wrote it down. I call it the baby talk system because you learn to communicate the way through music, the way we learn to communicate through language. Not, not even like learning a second language. This is like learning how we learned our primary language, right? When we're babies and we're just blabbering and pretending and playing and out of that becomes, comes order out of that chaos. So, if you could put up with me in Lounge Academy, if I've intrigued you, if there's some way I amazingly I don't know how long this has been going. Of course, I could always edit it down, but I won't bother. I'm just going to give you the whole horrible, agonizing lesson. I've got different camera angles, too. So when, when I'm showing you stuff, see, I could change that. I could do all that from the piano. Here's behind me. Here's outside. It's in front of a building. Here's all of it at once. Okay, so that's, this is what I do. I pr I'll give you a, a little hint of what we're going to do here. One of the things I, I like to do when I practice every day, and it's the most important thing, it's my most important task, MIT, in music. Because not every day you practice as much as you should, right? Especially if you're me. So... I try to at least do a half hour of, of just goofing around, right, of kind of non-structured playing. Sometimes I'll go into my repertoire um, just, just for lack of discipline. But I really try. The best sessions I have doing that is when I, I time it, I record it, record it on your gizmo, on your Android or whatever, your, your iPhone, record your practicing every day. I start and stop mine. So sometimes it takes me two hours to get through that half hour of, of this part of the practice where I'm, I'm doing loose, and you do different things. You do, do chromatics with random chords. Except I was starting to say, I remember the first day I did this back in 1996. I started with a G minor, and I had this idea. I'm just going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to play random chords as if a magic eight ball is coming up and saying, go to A flat, a flat minor. This is where it's good to have the Mahegan background where you've got these decent chord voicings you could just fall to. Um, but um, I, you probably don't have to, but it, I think it's a great thing, especially if you want to sound like you're playing within the genre of, uh, of that era of music where these, when these standards are written. And you just go from, in fact, here, here's an exercise. Play a chord in your favorite voicing that, at that moment. And then let a random chord root and then its you know definition appear in your mind like I'm okay I said a flat before I'm thinking a, to a flat minor so I'm G I always start with G minor that was the first chord I started with in 1996 when I started this so I don't know kind of for sentimental reasons I always start that way I'm already I'm already breaking my what I'm telling you guys to do just play the chord 
in your voicing. And then, um, okay, we'll go back. I'm thinking of A flat minor. And B in time, okay, so get some time going. Now I see, don't think formulatic, try not to. Try to play the wrong things, okay? Because you'll make the wrong things work eventually, and eventually you'll be fearless. Mistakes are your friend, okay? You want every note to be wrong. It's the primordial soup of your music is these randomness is, okay? So, I'm gonna, hey, there's, here's the, a form of a minor, I'm thinking, okay, and then, then I'm seeing on an F uh, flat uh, major, which kind of makes sense, doesn't it? They would, I just went two and then one chord, okay, that's all right. Point is, I didn't do the math. It came to me, okay. And then I'm now I'm seeing all of a sudden I, the magic eight ball of chords came up, and I see I, a D major seven. So I was going. I'm I'm doing. I'm kind of getting ahead of what I'm telling you to do because I'm I'm doing like melodic things in the right hand, you know, octaves or whatever the hell I'm doing. So you don't have to do that. What's more important than what you're playing, this is very important to this whole thing, is it's what's going on in here is where, where, we're, where we're taking all this. It's, it's what you're hearing through the headphones that are inside your head, okay? And it doesn't have to be real sophisticated, especially when you're starting out, or ever, okay? So you hear something, and just play along to that, and don't care if it's wrong. In fact, for, to make me happy, make sure it's wrong, okay? Never stop, never correct, because it wasn't wrong in here. It was only wrong out here. That's okay. Eventually, it's going to get more and more right, and you're going to learn how to make those mistakes turn into not mistakes because they're only mistakes to our ear if they're not handled properly after they're made. You know? You've heard that. They say there's no wrong notes. Well, it's how you follow up, and you'll learn to just instinctively. It's like when you're walking, you might, you know, you can trip and make it look like you didn't trip like I planned that, right? Like it's a dance step. That's how it is with this. And you'll find out that the mistakes, when, whenever you play something that you didn't hear in your head, like you meant to play, and you played this, like say you, you meant in your, hear, in your head you heard, and it came out, it's like, right, you know, well, that's only a mis you'll, you'll learn to cover that where you don't mind that you made it. In fact, I love the mistakes because the mistakes are more creative than I could ever be. I, you know, I could, I could imp from doing this every day, I could, I could go for a couple hours now of playing nothing. It started out, it's like I'd run out of ideas after five seconds, right? And every day, you build on it. You build your kind of your weapons arsenal, and your vocabulary builds, your, your phrases, your syllables, your phrases, your, your sentences, your paragraphs, your story. These are things, baby talk, like we're, that's how you learn a language in the first place, right? You learn a syllable, a word, a phrase. We're babies doing this. We're developing like an infant to learn how to improvise. So. The, um, the mistakes are your best, they really are your best friend. I, I don't just say that so that you won't be you know, so afraid of making them. Believe me, if you don't make these mistakes, if you don't make more mistakes than write notes, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be, I don't think you're gonna become much 
creatively because this is like an evolutionary, uh, an evolutionary process, um, our musicianship. And those, those mistakes are the, um, what, what, what do they call them in uh, DNA, you know, in genetics? You make, you make a mistake. It's the, I need another cup of coffee. The, uh, tell me, you, you know what I'm talking about. When there is, under Darwinism, there's a haphazard, you know, change in something, and it's a defect. But once in a while, that defect is actually a mutation. It's a mutation, okay? That's what a mistake is. I'm hearing something in my head. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find a way to I mis-execute. Figures, I won't make a mistake now. First time in my life. But you just, you just go, try to hear something in your head. If you're starting out, you're not going to hear what I just heard doing that, even though that's not like extremely, you know, I'm not exactly Bill Evans, you know, by any stretch. But that's me. And if I'm sounding like me, I'm convinced people will find it entertaining because that's part of the magic of music that I've discovered in my definition of the magic of music. One of the elements is you could take, here's an example. I think of a guy on a bus. You get on a bus, there's a guy sitting there at the end and uh, maybe he's talking to himself or he's talking to his neighbor or he's talking to, here in Buffalo people talk, okay? Maybe in your city they don't, but here you get on a bus, I would imagine. I haven't gotten on a bus in decades, but I know people who ride buses. My wife rides buses. You get on a bus and I'm, I'm just imagining, you know, somebody, they're on their phone, they're, they're talking to their friend or their whatever about their laundry or whatever they're talking about, their job, whatever they're talking about. They're talking to you. They're... And, and this particular person, let's just say this particular person just isn't really, to be honest, just not that interesting, right? They're, they're kind of an or ordinary person, you know? God bless them, you know? They're, um, you know, they're, they're, they're loved by their family, and they, they've got a whole life and everything. But to you, at that moment, uh, they don't seem like a very interesting person. Maybe they don't seem like a very interesting person to anybody else on the bus. Some people just aren't that interesting, right? They don't seem to be that interesting. Like a lot of subjects, they're not interesting until you get into them, and then you find anything's interesting that you take that you start to peel away some of the layers, of course, right? You can stare at a blade of grass and then get a microscope and start analyzing it, and you can dedicate your life to it and be fascinated. So, so I'm not trying to, you know, uh, say that, you know, people aren't uh, valid, but to you, there's, some people are very entertaining. They could be in public. They could a stranger, and they're entertaining everybody around them without doing a thing. They're just something about them is charismatic, or, or they're good. You know, maybe they're in, they've learned to be interesting. Uh, well, this person on the bus isn't interesting. So, however, you sit them at a piano, and I've done this, okay? You sit them at a piano, and they're, they're only mildly accomplished. And sometimes you've seen these people, a musician that is maybe they're very unsophisticated, maybe they're, maybe they're just beginning, maybe they haven't really spent much time at an instrument or a piano or singing. And you see them, they, they, you know, they go, oh, let me try that. And then they, they, I don't know, they start stabbing away. And you could tell. And you think, what the, why don't I have that? This person doesn't know what they've got, but you recognize it in them, right? 
And what they've got is a fearlessness in this instance that I'm conveying. They'll sit down and they'll, man, they bury that, they're, they're down at the bottom of the key, they're not shy. And something's coming through that's very, you know, they'll say, oh, let me pick out Happy Birthday or, or, or some song, the dumb song, right? And maybe they're making all kinds of slips and mistakes and stuff, but there's some, some honesty coming through there that your average person can't do. And you're wishing you had that. Usually it manifests in self in, in that you admire their fearlessness because we're all very shy, typically, we're all kind of shy when it comes to playing or practicing and, oh my God, somebody might hear me through the wall, you know, or try singing, you know. Um, takes a long time to overcome that. Really, the only way to overcome any of this shyness is just to humiliate yourself in public so many times or in front of people so many times um, that, you know, it, you've got nothing else to lose, right? That's the stage I'm at, finally, thank God. But um, the point I'm getting to is if somebody can remove all the barriers between themselves and the instrument, Describe what is themselves. And, and even if they're playing technically very poorly or unsophisticated, it's entertaining. There's something about that. That same person that is not very interesting who's blabbering in the bus, right? They just don't have a lot to say. You know, they might be talking, you know, wonderful things. They're talking about the weather, maybe their, their views on the news and topical events. And they're very nice, polite people, or not, you know, different personalities. But they're not, they're not saying anything you haven't heard before. You can almost finish their sentences for them, right? They're predictable. It's not interesting. It's not necessarily off-putting. It's just not interesting. You know, you're not, you're not going to remember it or enjoy it. Um, that same person using that same honesty of communication where it can come through them. I'm telling you, it's, we find it interesting. Now they're interesting, right? They don't have a lot to say, but they're saying it honestly. When you do that in a, vocally through conversation, it's not as interesting. When you can do that at the piano or another instrument or, or through your voice as an instrument, I'm convinced, even if you don't have a lot to say, for some reason it's interesting. I'm, that's magic, because I can't tell you why it's interesting, because that happens. It happens, and it's predictable results. There's the honesty, the uninhibitedness, where they're really communicating. They're not trying to say what they heard somebody else say or the way somebody else said it. They're not acting. They're not portraying. They're just saying it. They're saying it uh, looks like it's going to rain today. Looks like it's going to rain today. Looks like it's going to rain today. hell today, I know. It's going to rain today. See? I felt honest doing that. Could I be more honest with less impediments between whatever it is in me and the instrument? Hell yeah. We're always trying to strip those away. But is it basically? Yeah. Did it used to be? No. Could others tell the difference then? No. Because you don't know it till you hear it or see it. You know, if you're thinking, am I? Is he? Is that guy? Is, am I hearing this? Not. It's one of those things. You know it when you hear it. And you know it when you do it. And if you're not sure, it's probably not happening. So, how's that for you?
All right, well, this is my new approach to teaching, just like I made a new approach to how to improvise in, in 1996 and wrote it all down, followed it, forgot about what I wrote down uh, for like a 10-year period in there, even though I kept doing it, found the notes, looked and said, I'll be darned. I've been doing that. It all makes sense. It works. So if you're interested, say so in the comments here on YouTube. I'm going to put this on YouTube. I think this will get no views ever. No one, no one will get through this. God bless you if you get through this. But, you know, you got to, that guy who does get through it, I'll have a lot of confidence in because you got to be that kind of a nut to get good at doing this because there's no shortcuts. There's wrong paths and there's right paths. I think I found the right path, a right path. But there's really no shortcuts. There's shortcuts to faking it, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with learning to fake it if you've got a purpose. Like, I want to be able to sit down at a piano at a party and do one song and leave and impress all my friends and myself and leave. You know, so you could learn, you could learn to do that. Um, it, it, studying with me would not be a, a probably an efficient way to learn to fake it. I'd have to think about how to teach somebody to fake it, and I could probably come up with some great tips, you know, but um, that's not what I'm thinking about right now. So, and like I said, that's... I'm all for pragmatism. You know, if you've got a certain purpose, you need to learn to be, to be able to appear to be playing by a certain period of time. Go for it and do that. That's a talent, too. Um, what, I, what I'm here to offer us a possible, so what I believe to be a solution to is to... To, to repair that area of frustration that many people um, share that I felt and now feel to a much diminished degree because I've been found a way to resolve it is to how to really feel like you are playing. You know, you're not just memorizing you're not acting, you're not a trained flea, you're actually expressing the instant, right? Which, which you can do right now, because if you, what do you think I'm doing right now? I'm talking and you're, you're talking, probably talking to yourself by now after listening to me going on and on like this. And, when you when you when you talk to one of your buddies, you're improvising. It's the same thing, right? We're just going to learn to communicate through the music, through the same kind of mechanism, not as a second language, but as a primary language. That's why we start with baby talk. I'm going to take you through. You're going to be a babbling infant, and you're going to. Uh, grow your ability to, uh, to speak in music from a syllable, like ma, to a word like mama, dada, right? And then other words, and then you're gonna... The, what this does is it actually, it's not a sum total of everything you learn. It's, it's a new, talent that will emerge. It, this gives you the innate, the, this, this will give you innate, innate talent you never had, right? Which is, sounds like um, kind of oxymoronic, right? Innate talent, it, or, or let me say it another way. This will give you the, 
the natural born talent you weren't naturally born with. Because I developed, this is all based around my theory that um, what we consider to be natural born talent, um, and in many cases is, but if you don't have it, you, you can develop a lot of it. And your, your brain will, will create the, the canal ways and the new, the new strengths that that basic talent, that muscle, musculature to build upon, if you don't have it, yes, you can get it. Yes, you can have musical talent to learn to do this with. People say, I can't learn because I don't have any musical talent. Well, they're right, right? However, the, the misconception, the conventional wisdom is, if you don't have natural talent, if you can't carry a tune, you can't, then you never can. Well. I don't know that. That might be true in some people. I don't know. I thought it was true in me. And I learned to actually develop it to where I feel like I've got a musical aptitude now at, at some level. A pretty good one. You know, not great, but, and, but it keeps building. But I'm talking about the, not, not the ability, but the aptitude. You know, like, do you have that core basic aptitude to be able to do this? Um, I think, I don't know, with... Can, maybe everybody can. I don't know. I only tried it on me and kind of experimented with a few people in very small ways. You know, didn't really go all in with it with them, but it showed promising uh, results. So this is how to develop natural ability. So it takes a long time. It's like altering your body, because I think we are altering the physiology to do this. You need the physiology in order to put the ability on top of that. Like, you know, do you have the, were you born with the physiology to be able to be a weightlifter and lift 400 pounds like my nephew can? He used to be skinny, but you figure after life, you know, most of his life of training, he developed the ability to do what, what he can do. Now, a lot of people that do weight training and bodybuilding Say, well, there's only so much they can do without the DNA. Like, they'll never have the certain musculature to take it to that other level without the DNA. And uh, they're probably right. And that's probably true of, I'm sure it's tr true of music, too. But we can develop a certain level of aptitude that I think conventional wisdom is wrong in saying, we don't have, we can never have it. I did it to myself. It was hidden in there. Was it hidden or did it not exist? I don't think it existed. I don't think it was hiding, waiting to get out. I, I let it create itself. You know, I think of it like um, as, as nature providing a solution to a problem if you're if you're struggling with that problem every day. Like I think of somebody jumping over a stream and say every day of his life, he's got to run from, I'm thinking like in terms of that this has been going on before there was civilization. So I'm thinking there's this, this guy and he's got to run from one village to another Every day he's got to jump over this stream. Twice, there and back. He jumps as far as he can and, you know, goes a couple of feet, gets a hot foot, right? Goes through the mud and water, climbs out the rest, goes on with his day. Every day he tries to jump that stream. 20 years later, okay, this guy is like a grasshopper. He's way older and less athletic overall. But the, the musculature developed so that he can build the strength and maintain the strength with those muscles to jump the entire 10 feet or whatever it is, right? which would be impossible when he started. 
The guy could have been an engineer and had access to all kinds of engineering formulas about jumping and not been able to do it because you don't have the basic musculature, the innate ability, the natural born ability, right, to do it. So nature responds every day and knows that you're trying to do, you've got this problem and you're trying to solve it and it's gonna start giving you the tools to do it, not just the know-how, but the physiology. And I think that's how talent is. I think talent is physiology in part in, of the brain, physiology of the brain. To where, you know, are you good mechanically? Are you good mathematically? Are you good artistically? Visually, you know, um, are you good at speaking and communicating your, with other people verbally, you know? All those things. You're better at some than others. Well, I, I believe if you're faced with that challenge every day and you spend a certain amount of time on it, you gotta spend time on it every day, those parts of the brain that weren't there, right? Those smaller areas of the brain, whatever they are, will get larger and like muscles. And now the physiology, the tissues will exist to be able to conduct those neurons or allow the blood flow or do whatever, however the heck they work. That's, that's, my, that's how I think this works. So that's why this takes so long. You want to learn to, to communicate you want to be a music, musical and you don't have any musical ability, well, you can do the busy work every day, which doesn't hurt, which is studying the theory and what scales go with what chords and try to apply them mathematically and formulaically. And that's all fine, because I guess you gotta be busy while you're waiting for the talent to arrive. But by, by facing these challenges every day, the talent will start to arrive to where you'll be, be a natural musician that is now applying the theory and all these things to this natural ability that you've, you've acquired. You're gonna acquire natural ability, right? Sounds, like I said, it sounds oxymoronic. Because I think the definition of natural ability is something that cannot be acquired. It's something you're either born with it, you're lucky in the lucky DNA club or not, right? So. That's what we're out to prove or disprove. Worked on me, I'm convinced. Unless, although who knows? Maybe I had latent talent to, the, to this degree. I'm not saying I'm, I have all kinds, I'm, I'm not. It's taken me, you know, I'm mature in life now and I'm just like getting a little bit of traction with this. I've been trying since I was seven, okay? So I am the poster child for not having natural ability and now having some you know whatever level I'm at um, people don't believe me you know they come up and when I'm playing in public they'll go when would you start you know I don't explain it anymore I mean I did start when I was seven you know but I don't explain how it got me nowhere until I was you know in my 50s <laughs> they don't believe me. You know, they go, oh, you've been playing all your life. You know, you're lucky. I don't have any ability. I can... Yeah, okay, well, it's too bad, you know. I used to try to explain it, you know, until I realized they don't want it. They don't want to know that, you know. So, and that's why nobody's going to be here at the end of this video because you probably didn't want to know it either. But it's the way it is. So, in my mind, I think, I'm convinced, if you want more, comment and uh, I don't expect any traction on this I don't expect a single anybody to make it to the end of this if you make it to the end of this I'll be surprised if a bunch of people do if a bunch of people think this is great I'll be amazed I'm convinced it works I'd be psyched if people wanted to learn it it just I'd like to carry it forward people invested in me I had some great people investing in me, um, you know, so I don't, I don't mind um, sharing 
if it helps people. Here's a split view again. It's not working, okay. Okay, it's rebooting. All right, we'll see you guys later. My name's Howard. This is Lounge Academy. Here we go, see this? Until next time, don't make any plans. I just ate up my whole practice time blabbering to probably nobody. So, but that's it. I decided, you know, I do want to teach on some level with YouTube like this, but I've given up on trying to come up with a, a structured, normal, kind of concise thing. That isn't my bag. You know what? That's not the way this works either. This is all kind of, it's, a, it's the same way. Your brain has to work the same way. I'll see you guys next time. WBIG TV. Thanks, everybody. We're out. Don't make any plans. I'll play you out. I hope you watch me on YouTube. And don't think that I'm the big boob. WBIGTV. Someone said when we shook hands, this was just some dub YouTube channel to me. Then I watched five more hours. You're the guy who understands. I'm a guy who must be able to play free And all at once I thought of chords All at once I thought of notes All at once I owned the keyboard and the vocals Now I can play whatever the heck I want I don't have to read sheet music if I don't want to anymore. That was a bore. Now I watch WBIG TV. And I really play. Thanks, everyone.